Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio this year. I'd like to welcome everybody to the third session uh, today in our advocacy series. It's great to see so many members joining us today to learn about um, bringing out the advocate inside of all of us. As you will hear today, um, no matter where you are in your career or where your interests are, there are opportunities for you to use your voice to advocate for the issues that are mo you're most passionate about in your community. Uh, the format of today's session will be a more casual conversation learning style where our colleagues will share with us what inspired them to become advocates and the interesting pathways they are on as community leaders. Uh, before we start today's program, though, I'd like to recognize and thank our AI Ohio featured gold sponsor for today's program, who is Terracon. Terracon is a multidisciplinary firm. They specialize in environmental facilities, geotechnical, and material services. Uh, they have about 150 offices nationwide, including offices in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus. Um, I encourage you to learn more about Terracon at www.terracon.com. And when you reach out to them for your next project, please do let them know that you appreciate their support of AI Ohio. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank also our annual sponsors whose logos are shown on our screen now. Um, so we have some good news to share today with our advocacy group. Uh, Senate Bill 49, the payment assurance for design professionals was unanimously passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday, and it's on its way to the Senate floor. So we're excited about that. Uh, this type of proactive legislation is not possible without the support of the 2021 AI Ohio PAC contributors. Their names are listed on the screen now and uh, on the AI Ohio website. Um, if you have not already, please consider joining your fellow colleagues and making a contribution to the AI Ohio PAC so that we can continue to have a strong voice advocating for the profession in the state of Ohio. Um, upcoming programs. So mark your calendar now. The next advocacy session series entitled Advocacy in You is scheduled for Wednesday, May 19th. I hope to see everyone in May and that you continue to engage in Ohio's advocacy efforts throughout the year. There's a couple other items also on the screen. We have two sessions from our design lecture coming up. The next one being April 29th um, with Lori Hawkinson and then May 27th, Monica Chandra. Those are both at a 5 p.m. time frame. Uh, let's see, finally, I'd like to introduce our advocacy series committee members. My uh, co-chair, Bruce Sikanik, FAIA from AIA Youngstown, give us a wave. Uh, Matt Toddy, AIA from AIA Columbus, and our executive director, uh, Kate Brunswick. Bruce and I will be co-hosting our session today and Matt's gonna be hosting our Q&A. Um, so joining us, we're gonna have four members of AI Ohio will be sharing their experiences as community advocates. They include Emily Little from AIA Akron. Hi, Emily. Aaron Curley from AIA Toledo. Aaron's with us here today. Um, Judd Klein from AIA Cleveland. And Alex Bowler from AIA Dayton. Hi, Alex. So unfortunately, um, I do wanna share that Representative Amelia Sykes, the minority leader of the Ohio House was unable to join us today uh, due to a last minute scheduling conflict with something important like the budget bill. So uh, we'll have to take a rain check from her and you can look forward to hearing her um, at our July 21st session. She's rescheduled with us. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Our program is scheduled for one and a half hours. We'll, Kate will be dropping a link in the chat box towards the end of the session that you'll need to do to com complete to get your learning units. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. We'll be hosting Q&A at the, at the, with all the presenters today at the end of the program, and we look forward to hearing uh, your questions. Um, let's see, I think that's about everything. So Bruce, let's get started with the in first interview with Emily Little from AIA Akron. Okay, thanks, Karen. Give you a little bit of a breather here so you don't have to talk all the way through the program. Uh, welcome to today's program. Um, 
we we had selected uh, four of these individuals here because of, of the different ways that they have been working within their communities and within advocacy. And, and as Karen just said, uh, Emily, Emily Little from AIA Akron uh, was our first guest here. So Emily, um, you and I chatted over the last few weeks here. And um, I assume you just didn't wake up one day and find yourself on the board and uh, trying to figure out what, what you were doing and why you were there. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you first started to get involved in, in, um, in, in Wadsworth and your community and, and how that all came about. Sure. So um, I have a good friend who is actually the executive director of Main Street Wadsworth. And I was kind of familiar with the Main Street program, um, but I started to get more involved when she became executive director. Um, the Main Street programs are um, meant to help revitalize and um, preserve our historic downtowns all across the nation. So um, our Main Street community started doing First Fridays, which I know a lot of Main Street communities do. Um, where we put on events every first Friday of every month, um, where we get our local businesses, our downtown businesses involved in some sort of fun theme, and we draw a lot of people to our downtown um, for a number of different things. There's usually activities for kids, um, lots of uh, discounts and deals and special things going on in all of the retail stores and the restaurants. Um, so when my friend Adrian started um, really kind of developing the program, she started um, prior to Main Street Wadsworth being a Main Street community. It was known as Downtown Wadsworth, and they did a lot of the same sort of things. But becoming a Main Street community really helped elevate the level um, and the opportunities that were available for Main Street Wadsworth. So about five years ago, we became Main Street Wadsworth. Um, and then I want to say that Adrian was hired as the executive director to start the program as a Main Street program. Um, so through the grapevine, I heard that they were opening positions on the board. And I had recently um, decided to stop the traditional career path um, so I was looking for a way to sort of hone my passions and interests. So it seems like a perfect storm for me. So um, I went and interviewed with a couple of the executive board directors. Um, and shortly after that, I was uh, notified that I, they were accepting me onto their board. So it was, that's how I got involved in have been since. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, so you enjoyed the parties and decided to join the group then, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I kind of started as a uh, as a spectator coming downtown and having a great time, seeing all that Main Street had to offer, and then thinking, oh, okay, well, I could do something. You know, I can participate. And then it turned into something sort of completely different, which is good, I think. Right. And it probably doesn't hurt that, you know, your background has been in preservation in many ways, and that's really closely tied with what you're doing with the Main Street program in Wadsworth. So Very yeah, I'm true. not sure if everyone knows that, right, exactly. So um, so you enjoyed the events. Uh, um, what did your involvement mean for Main Street Wadsworth? I mean, how did it change things? <laughs> yeah, so that's a, that's a good question and a good point that I think everyone here in this meeting um, needs to hear. Um, when I started, when I interviewed uh, for the board position, I had asked the question, do you have any other architects or designers on your board and have you? And in their time as a Main Street community, which had been two years, but the even prior to as a downtown Wadsworth community, um, there hadn't been architects or designers kind of leading the charge. And the Main Street community focuses on a four point approach where uh, you have four different committees that make up the organization. You have an organization committee, which sort of um, handles a lot of the um, behind the scenes administrative sort of things. 
you have promotions, which is the party planning. Um, <laughs> you have economic vitality, um, and then you have design. So all this time we've been operating as a uh, Main Street community with a design committee, but with very limited um, access to architects and designers. So you have a lot of um, good intentioned um, community uh, people within your community, but um, they were sort of lacking that, that piece of really having someone on board who can help direct things in the right path. So the professional insight you were able to bring into that and provide them with a little more than, well, I like this, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and helping the people, especially on the design committee, helping them understand maybe why they like a certain thing or, um, you, you know, being able to tell someone, oh, you like this design better than this design because of the proportions are good, because the colors are complementary, because the style of this, this piece and this piece go together nicely. So just being able to put those sorts of things into words um, is not something that most, um, most people can do. So it's, uh, I feel like I bring value to that, that part of it too. That's great. That's great. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure you're you're making a bundle of money by participating on this committee, right? <laughs> like, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. And Main Street volunteers are, um, you're expected to donate at least 10 hours of your time every month. Um, and we don't always make that. Um, but it is sort of a, an understanding that I, you know, when I had my interview with um, with the board members, it was like, this is a working board. You, you can't just come onto this board and then just sit idly by. We expect you to do things and get things done. So there was, a, there was an expectation that was set um, and it's, it's a good um, standard to be expected to meet. Yeah, that, and, and, you know, I, th I think there's, there's a lot of very good boards out there that, that have those same requirements. You know, you don't, you don't have a lot of people to work with. So it's, it's, it's nice when everyone pitches in uh, the way they should. Um, but so you're not getting paid. What are you getting out of it? What, 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 you know, that, that's always a hard question. What are you getting out of it? What is it that drives you, that uh, keeps you involved and keeps you uh, participating? There's a lot of... Um personal reward for it. Um, just knowing that I'm bringing something to my community that they wouldn't have without my involvement, of course, is always nice. I feel like I am making a difference um, in a way that um, I've been trained to in my profession, but yet still means something to me because it's so close to home. Um, it also has opened up um, some doors. Um, for instance, I'm now on the, I mean, you know how this goes. Once you sign up for, for one thing, you can have a phone call again and again, right? Um, but now I'm on the architectural design committee for the city. Um, I have uh, I have working relationships with, with the people on the executive board that I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't made those steps to, um, to start forming those relationships. Um, so that's also been nice and rewarding. And then, um... so, something that, that you kind of build on. And, and full disclosure, there's there's also another person on Main Street's Wadsworth whose son happens to be on this call right now. That Matt Toddy's father is also on Main Street Wadsworth. So <laughs> I know disclosure. I was trying to watch my words. I'm like, am I going to offend Matt or his dad <laughs> by saying that? That the design committee doesn't doesn't have someone of of my caliber on it. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't get the occasional email about it. <laughs> Is he asking for advice? Yeah, that's right. It's like, yeah, hey, that looks smarter than Emily. Can you give me some advice? <laughs> Matt's dad and I are the two. Um, kind of leading the charge in the design committee. And so we're partners in crime in a lot of ways. So. 
I'll, I'll ask a question here, Bruce. Sure. I, I mean, going through this experience, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'd have some great suggestions that you can make to others who want to get involved in their community. You know, what kind of suggestions would you offer? Um, yeah, absolutely. First of all, just do it. Our communities need us, um, whether they know it or not. Um, you can always start small. Um, for instance, the Main Street community um, is like I said, there are the four committees and those are each run by, um, they can be someone who is on the board of directors or just a, um, a community volunteer who has a specific interest in one of those. So starting on a committee, if I had to do things over again, I probably would have started on a committee first to kind of get my feet wet um, and then ramp up to the board. It was a little bit of a culture shock sort of coming right in and not understanding much about how the organization itself works. Um, so starting small, I think is good. Or if you feel like you're jumping in with both feet, that's also certainly welcomed in a lot of communities. Would you do it all over again? Yeah, for sure. I mean, okay. this, is my, this is my third year and you can do two terms. So I will, probably be signed up for another three-year term. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is great. Well, we, we appreciate your insight on this. I, I think, you know, it's it's great to get out in the, in the community and, and do the type of things that, that you're doing. I know very many cities are all set up differently and, and that's maybe part of the challenge is to finding out where, where you can go and where you need to be. But uh, I think basically through your comments is it's just reach out and try to find uh, find that place is, is it would be the, the, the best way to get involved. So, uh, so l let me ask you one last question here is um, your involvement, what has it done for the profession of architecture? Do you think it's had an impact with those within the community and on the board? Um, have, have be, you being there, has it, has it raised, um, raised awareness of architecture and architects? I think so. I like Matt said, I get more questions now, um, now that I've sort of proven myself and people understand that I know what I'm talking about. Um, we recently did a, uh, a grant project through Heritage Ohio, which is the, um, the umbrella that all of the Main Street communities are within. And um, that grant actually had a, a matching grant from the city. So we had a total of $40,000 to spend within our downtown area. We decided to focus the, the grants. Um, we asked that they focused on paint, awnings, and signage. And so um, I was on a committee with Matt's dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we went through, uh, I think, 15 to 20 different applications from our downtown business owners who were looking to make improvements to their buildings. Um, and having the experience that I have, I, I know that one of the stipulation, stipulations of that grant was that any changes made to the building that used that grant money needed to meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And so just having that experience in that committee um, was such a help um, because I could identify pretty quickly, you know what, this is a good project, but this part of it is not going to be acceptable. Um, and so I think that um, by putting myself out there and sort of um, just spewing my information <laughs> at people within the community <laughs> who um, know that I can be used as a resource now, um, I, I think that has made a difference for sure. Well, great. Well, we, we, we appreciate you spending the time here. We hope you'll hang on with the rest of the call so we can get all these questions at the end. <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate uh, you, you, um, you giving us your experience and, and what it means to be part of Main Street Wadsworth. We're going to jump to now to the, the, the second uh, person who, who has volunteered to be part of this program, and that is Aaron Curley from AIA Toledo. Uh, welcome, Aaron. Um, we're glad you're able to make it here. Um, I guess I just want to start out by saying, Aaron, you, know, you haven't been practicing that long and you're the owner of, of uh, your own firm now. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, I, so I became licensed in 2016. 
Um, but I believe it or not, I actually have 20 plus years experience in the industry. Um, right out of high school, I started with electrical construction. Um, and then I, during my undergrad, I ended up placing in a firm where I spent um, my first 10 years. Then I jumped around a little bit and decided it was time to do what I really ultimately wanted to do, which is start my own firm, um, which has been a passion of mine since high school. So I um, grew up in Michigan, Ottawa Lake, Michigan, which is just over the line from Ohio. So Toledo has always kind of been my big city home. Um, never really wanted to move outside of the Toledo region. I think it's it's a great place to live. We've got a lot to offer here. And the best part is, is the, the cost of living is reasonable. So it allows for travel and other things that maybe some larger cities don't allow for. So, yeah. yeah, thank you, Erin. I'll jump in here a little bit. So I know you've been involved in a lot of groups up in your area, providing community service like the Sylvania Area Family Services and the America League of Northwest Ohio. Maybe you could bring everybody up to speed a little bit about those organizations and what you've done for them. Sure, so um, the Sylvania Area Family Services is a, it's a community center um, type service that they had an existing building and, and during my time at Architecture by Design, we were contracted to do an addition for them. Um, and one of the things that's great about their program is they, like a many, many family services, they have all kinds of programs from youth diversion to, you know, food pantry and then education classes for a diverse population. But um, back in 2007, uh, we were contracted to do a project for them. And then the recession hit and all of their private donors had kind of backed out. Um, so we proceeded with just the shell of the building and, um, Really what ended up happening is through my connections with the union trades, I knew the apprentices needed help. They needed their hours. And so I got that one connected and, and that project ended up lasting three years to do an interior build out um, for, for the space with all donated materials and labor. And then similar, similarly, when I was working with SSOE um, in 2007, end of 2017, um, beginning of 2018, uh, the America League of Northwest Ohio had approached the firm. Um, another colleague from SSOE was currently on the board. And the America League of Northwest Ohio is an organization that, it's a national organization, but locally here in Toledo, it started in uh, 2010. Um, in 2012, they built the field. It's an all rubberized baseball field. And the organization really focuses on Giving, providing opportunities for youth and adults to play the national pastime, which is baseball, no matter what their abilities are. So the players, there's no cost to the players to play. Um, and anybody from an able-bodied able -bodied individual to those who may have um, some type of mobility are allowed to play. And um, the organization really was in need of a new facility um, out at their existing field in Northwood, Ohio. The, the, current, the current facility that they had was basically a shed for concessions and a, a accessible porta potty. So it was great that they at least had that, but unfortunately for many of these players, they need assistance and the porta potty just really doesn't allow for a second person to kind of help them in that uh, task. So um, they had approached SSOE, I was an employee at the time and one of the only architects in the department who had kind of jumped in and said, yeah, I'll help out. Um, and it's, it's been a pro bono effort ever since. It's another three years. I, I starting to feel like three years is the, the key here to pro bono work and, and finishing out projects. But um, essentially it's a new concession, concession facility which provides um, one full, what we call a family, accessible toilet room with a, a full adult changing table and then two multi-drop toilet rooms which also have accessible stalls, concessions, scorekeeper area. So it's, it's going to be a great facility that really allows not only the players to to get the services that they need but also allow them to maybe hang out and socialize a little bit more above and beyond what they've been able to do. So those are kind of the two projects that um, are, are the big key ones I guess in my career. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you really combine sort of your architectural skills and knowledge and training with sort of hands-on work. Maybe you could 
um, go into that a little bit more about your involvement in the actual construction and, and design? Yeah, so like I said, I did start, my father was a, um, a union rep for the IBEW. So I got into electrical construction very young out of high school. Um, and so that's kind of always been in my, in my history. Um, and when, as I transitioned into architecture and these specifically these projects came up, especially with Sylvania FAM, a lot of times when you're working on projects such as these very community oriented, very volunteer based, I've always been of the, the mindset that you can't just leave it up to everyone else. You have to be, be willing to get your hands dirty as well. So specifically with Sylvania FAM, I mean, I was up in the trust space insulating, you know, putting up this queen, putting up baffles, um, cutting ceiling tiles, all, all the things that you do to just, how can we cut costs? What can we do ourselves? But the nice thing about that was, is the director at the time, he was not um, very construction savvy as many, many organization leaders may not be. That's not their forte. Um, so it was really nice to kind of be hands-on and get him involved and kind of teach him as we went. So he would be doing it right next to me. And then similarly with the, the Miracle League, I've spent the last month insulating the, the ceiling space. Um, I, I kind of sometimes drag my parents with me, make them, make them my grunts, but you, know, <laughs> it's, you do what you have to do sometimes to get things done and keep progress moving. Um, we were fortunate enough, we had some, um, SSOE has been a really uh, great partner in this project, and they had a, a group that came out and helped with some of the insulation as well. So, you know, it's great when you can kind of create those extra external connections and, and get more people involved. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. So really some hands-on learning early in your career. I mean, really early, early on where you're still um, working on the a young professional working on the on your skill set from the drawing side, I'm sure as well, spec side as well. Sure. Um, so it doesn't sound like you originally started out maybe on the board in a traditional manner. It sounds like maybe you started out on a project volunteer basis or pro bono work. Could you maybe share about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and that's exactly the case, Karen. It, you know, I started with specifically with the Miracle League. I started with the project. And then through the project, it was um, kind of the end of 2018. So again, we started the project in late 2017. And then about a year after that, I was approached by the president of the board who said, you know, you're, I really like your, your energy. I think you can bring a lot to the board. They really, they had an engineer um, on the board currently, but I think he was just seeing with regard to the building project that having me as the architect added that extra layer of insight, you know, because as architects, we're generalists, right? So we kind of see the whole picture. Um, and I, and he just really wanted my energy and kind of my let's get it done attitude. How do we find a way to get it done? So I started um, going to board meetings and now sometimes I kind of feel like my, my personality is kind of just let's, let's do it. I'm very assertive in that sense. So sometimes I kind of feel like I'm stepping on toes, but, um, you know, sometimes I think boards need that though, too. You need a personality who can kind of push people a little bit and, and get things done. Um, so I'm currently sitting on that board and, um, you know, it's, it's been great. It's, it's been fun to, to get involved. Uh, we actually just had our registration day for spring season on this past Sunday and it's exciting to see all the kids who are ready to get back and play baseball. And a lot of them haven't even seen the building shell up. So, you know, they heard about it, but they're really excited to kind of just see the building. That's gotta be pretty rewarding as a volunteer. So um, you've, you've given a lot, I mean, to these different community organizations, but there must, is there anything that's come back to you or things that you didn't expect from getting involved in these type of projects? Yeah, I mean, you know, expectation, I've always kind of been a believer and you don't necessarily get involved in something because you want something. I, I've just learned that that doesn't necessarily, it's not cyclical in that sense. So when I approach a project, I'm getting into it, looking at it from a bigger picture. How does this help an organization? How does it help, you know, other people, the community? Um, but there have been some surprising, um, so as you mentioned, 
or as Bruce mentioned, I'm kind of a new firm owner. I only started my firm in 2019, the end of 2019. So right before a pandemic, you know, I'm a startup. Um, but I will say I've been very fortunate um, with all that I am involved in in Toledo, above and beyond Miracle League. Uh, I have a lot of connections and that has helped me to progress through um, because of Miracle League and what I've done there. Um, since I started the firm, I've been connected to six projects, one of which has a, you know, eight to $12 million price tag right now, construction costs. So, um, you know, we're still tweaking it. It's very preliminary, but I know that one's coming. Um, and, and, you know, that's not why I got involved in it, but it's nice to know that because of what I'm doing, I've been able to, to get connected to other businesses and, and other projects. Well, I'm going to jump in here, Karen, and, and maybe ask a similar question that we asked Emily earlier. So um, what advice or suggestions would you have for someone looking to get involved in community activity? Um, I, I think there's a couple. So I would say there's a couple things. Number one, do a little bit of research. I mean, I'm kind of a yes person. I've been known to just say yes. I have a hard time saying no, which has beat me up a lot in the past. Um, I will say that the past year, I've really started to take a step back and started to evaluate that. But one of the things that has come from that um, personal insight is, you know, really take a moment to evaluate what the ask is of, of somebody if you're approached or if you have an interest take the time to really research what the organization is and understand yourself. What is your passion? Don't, I've, I've always been a very firm believer in, I never want to be a part of something just for a title or just because it's going to build my resume. I have to feel that I have a purpose. I have to know that I'm valued and I have to, most importantly, I have to know that I am giving back in some way or another. So take, before you just say yes, just take the time to, to look at the organization. And if you, if your passions align and the values align, that's when you're going to be your best. That's when you're going to be the most beneficial to that organization. And that's when the whole thing just radiates and, and spider webs out and creates just constant positivity and, and a good feeling for everyone, the whole community benefits then. Uh, that. Fantastic, Aaron. You know, you feel like you just want to go out and start doing things with <laughs> your energy. So, yeah, um, that's what happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and just like Emily, you find out you start something, and then you get moved and moved and moved to something else. So, yeah. but we, it's great. We we appreciate you you sharing your experiences here, and 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 hope that that continues as as your as your firm picks up speed as well. So, um, we're we're, we're glad you've been able to for your experiences with us. Um, and we're going to jump now, I think, to our third guest. And that's someone that a lot of people here already uh, know quite well. And that's uh, Judd Klein from AIA Cleveland. Uh, Judd, welcome. I'm going to unmute myself. First of all, I have to apologize. Uh, I My internet's been really freaky today, so I may freeze up from time to time. I'll just go right. like this. I, <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I thought you were going to say you, you're apologizing. You're not Judd Klein, but no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You're not, because it would be much easier if you were. <laughs> you say that now. So, so let, let me let me go back a few years, okay? And um, I was up at the office of Hirschman Ar Architects. Um, I, I was up there to attend your retirement party. Okay? <laughs> and uh, that evening was a transition point for you in many ways. But let's talk about how you got involved in community service before that evening. So well, tell us how you, how you first got started in community service. You know, you have to go way back further than that. I think there were dinosaurs still roaming the earth. But, um, <laughs> uh, my experience actually goes back to my days in college, but where it became more formalized is in the, in the 90s when I became very involved with a lot of educational programs and trying to lead uh, and develop programs in schools for, uh, for architecture, starting with uh, a program we initiated at the Cleveland School for the Arts as an introduction to architecture in the 19, um, 1990s. And I stayed with that pony um, as long as you could ride it. And then it eventually became the John Hay School of Architecture and Design at, at the, in the CMSD. 
and, and got onto that horse um, through AIA's AI 150 program. We, you know, AIA Cleveland took that on as our um, project. And uh, I started with that, uh, doing that, and uh, continue to be involved in educational programs. Um, but I've also been involved in the community directly. Um, in about that same time, late 90s, I uh, ran into our mayor at the grocery store, and I was talking about the need for a better mechanism for approving architectural design in our community. There was no ABR at that point. And uh, I suggested the creation of an ABR and she bought into it and said, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so in 2000, 2001, I think I became the first architect on the Orange Village uh, ABR. And that sort of led my path you know, up to where um, in 2013, I, I became a consulman and uh, I served on, the, and still serve on the planning commission because I had to give up my seat on the planning, on the architectural review board to become a consulman. And then the council said, well, you're the representative to consul for, to, from consul on the planning commission. So you go back there. So, so, so that night I met you at your office. What, what were you doing that evening after you uh, had a few drinks and ran out? Uh, that, was, that was very entertaining. Um, <laughs> there's a little preamble to that, Bruce, that I think is worth telling because it's kind of humorous. Um, one of the things that I was doing uh, in, at John Hay back then, this was like 2012, um, I ran a program for the ninth graders at, at, called Careers with a Passion. And it was designed to help kids find their career paths. And um, with that being said, they had to take this little exam, this little test that was a preference test. And if you, you know, what it spun out was about 12 or 14 different career paths that would, you know, that might align with some of their interests. So I said, what the hell, I'm going to take this so I know what the kids are going to do. And I took this test and lo and behold, architecture was not at the top of the list. <laughs> it was down at the bottom. It was like out of 16, it was 14. And what was at the top of the hit of that list was um, broadcast journalist and politician. And I'm I said, not okay. surprised. <laughs> um, I said, okay, I can't do at this point, become a broadcast journalist, but I might be able to become a politician. So at that point, there became a vacancy on the console in Orange Village. And uh, I applied, decided I would throw my hat in the ring uh, because I'd watched for years what was going on on console and it was not very pretty and it wasn't very productive. And I felt that I could add something and bring value to the community by doing so. And so I was one of 12 candidates that was interviewed by console to fill that vacant seat and going back now to the your original question is what was i doing the night of my retirement party was that night that i was interviewed by consul for uh taking that seat and i was the last person interviewed of the the 12 candidates and i was then appointed to fill that seat and uh and i've run for office in fact I'm running for office again this fall. Um, and your uh, first campaign out of the season, I see. Yeah, yeah first, yeah, shameless promotion. <laughs> so, so I, let, let me push on to the next question. So, um, you've always put yourself out there, Judd. We all know that. Um, but what does your perspective bring to the board that wasn't there in the past to council that wasn't there in the past? Well, I think there are a lot of things that architects bring to the board and we need to ex accept our creative leadership that we can bring to communities. Um, the ability to see things that aren't there yet, the abilities to convene people and bring them together, um, and the ideas of, of uh, legislative and uh, policy actions that our communities need to consider that they probably haven't done so before. Um, I brought about a number of different initiatives. I'm a very strong believer in the fact that architects can be a uh, catalyst for those civic initiatives. Um, 
Orange Goes Green certification program that we've created. Uh, I led the creation of that as a member of the Design Review Board and Planning Commission, um, instigated uh, the uh, Orange Village photovoltaic um, legislation to encourage and promote um, uh, photovoltaic systems in the community. Uh, we just recently, and there's been some articles in the newspaper, uh, created what we call the Ready Committee um, of Council, which is the Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee that I'm leading along with one of my other colleagues to explore potential uh, policy and legislative changes that, and, and community changes that we need to make amongst ourselves to uh, better deal with the kinds of situations that we've been seeing over the last year. And uh, so it's all of these different act areas. We, you know, architects are sort of involved. In everything that we see, we're interested in. And, and the ability to bring that together for the community and enable them to see what they need to see to accomplish it. Things like the Pinecrest development that has been so transformative to the community. Uh, I was involved with from day zero in, in, in promoting and developing that and continue to be as it goes on. And I, uh, we just have so much capability that we have to be willing to share and not be afraid to step up and be in front of the community. Bruce, you muted yourself. Yeah, I know, I know, I did that so I wouldn't disturb you while you were you're talking there. So, so um, you know, I guess one of the things that we're looking at is um, follow up is. Orange has benefited quite a bit from your participation. I know when we spoke last, um, one of the things you said is the sitting on the planning commission or on the board of zoning appeals, and then and you you know it from both sides. You know you see these things uh, that few few others get to to see. Um, how have you benefited uh, from this? You know, and I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm just like Emily and 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 uh, Aaron. You know, I'm not talking about you know, in, in ways that you've got business or things like that. How have you benefited from there's, being part of this? That, you know, I've seen the world from both sides now and, <laughs> and uh, you know, stealing some. <laughs> That's a song. But, right? <laughs> yeah. but there's, a, there's a level of, well, first of all, and I'm gonna go back and reference our, our former executive vice president and, and uh, David Fields and something that he said many years ago and continue to say, you're either at the table or on the menu. And I felt it was more important to be at the table and being at the table enables you to have access, access to others. I can call our state legislators, our state senators, our, um, our state governor, and he'll call me back. And I can ask him something or talk to him about something that I think is important. I can introduce ideas uh, about things that we want to do. And that gives you a, a, a great feeling of, of accomplishment and, and being meaningful. But the real value, you know, for what's in it for me program is when I go to another community, um, I have a certain, I guess I'll say cachet that if I go to before an architectural review board or planning commission, um, I understand their pain and I understand their issues and what they're trying to accomplish and deal with. And that brings great value to my clients that have me present to those communities. It gives them a much better path to success. Um, there is a general fear that people have about being on a board, running for political office, all of these things that it might preclude you from getting work. But on the other hand, it enables you to get work because people see you in sort of an, a, an elevated state. You're out in the public and there, there may be some conflicts and I've had those issues that have come up and I said, I really can't take this project because it would, you know, it would appear as a conflict of interest, uh, mm -hmm. but there are other projects that come about as a result of it. We saw what you did, we heard about you and, and we think you would add great value to what we're doing. 
So it, it creates access. And that's, I think, what is real value. But more important, and going back to things that both Emily and Aaron talked about, is it creates purpose in your life. It creates meaning and value to the things that you do every day. And there's no price to that. That's true. That's priceless. Um, so I'm going to just jump in here for a little bit. There's, it's, you know, not too many architects run for political office. So can you give, can you give our group some ideas of um, if they're, maybe they're thinking about running for council, they want to become mayor, or they might even want to join the state assembly. Um, any, any advice? Um, any advice is uh, don't be afraid to put it out there. Um, the real challenge is this is advice that I got from my, my uncle who was a councilman uh, in the city of South Euclid for many years. He said, you can't run for office before you walk the city. You have to walk the city and get to know the people that you're going to represent. So the first thing you need to do is understand what you're passionate about and what's meaningful to you and then figure out what's meaningful and passionate in the community. And you do that by talking to your your friends and neighbors uh, in, in the community and determine whether you have something to, something to contribute, which you do, each and every one of you, each and every one of you <laughs> has something significant to contribute to your community and ought to be doing so in some way or fashion. Um, then it's a matter of telling your story, having a message. And I'm gonna, I invented this word in 2009 for another AIA Ohio program that I did for Bruce um, was called RY3. You remember that, Bruce? Absolutely. And, and the word is called proeminate. I was just telling a, a, a mentee about this today. Proeminate. You're all familiar with the word pro, preeminent, which is someone who is the highest person in their field. Proeminate is a little mm -hmm. different. Proeminate is, regards the idea that un, you understand somebody else's pain and your skill set can help solve their problem. And understanding what your skill set is and being able to communicate it to that other person or organization mm -hmm. is invaluable. And being able to project that in a way that is val valid and accepted and understood by that group is absolutely essential. So when you can, first of all, know who you are know what your skills are, what your competencies are, what your capabilities are, know what you can't do, what you don't do well, because somebody's going to, somebody's going to throw that one at you. They're going to trip you up. You know, so far, nobody's dug deep into my closet because there's all kinds of skeletons there. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know, at some point they will, and I just have to answer for it, but um, know who you are. Uh, in the words of Shakespeare, know thyself, Leites, and, <laughs> and then know what they are, know what their needs are, know what the community's situation is, and then you can be invaluable because you can project what your abilities are with what theirs are and align them, and you all go off together. Great. Yeah, there's, make, there is- They make really cool posters. <laughs> really cool well, Jeff, there, there is one more thing we, we talk about there not being uh, that many architects who actually get throw their hat in the political arena but you're actually following someone's footsteps right i mean you, you've been watching someone else and you've been doing this stuff so yeah it's like if he could do that i could do that um, <laughs> and that would be bob fiala um you know bob's path has been very similar as as i've always said Architectural Review Board Planning Commission is the entry level drug to politics for architects. <laughs> and Bob followed that path and then became city councilman in Willoughby. He's now the mayor of Willoughby. And, uh, doing and Bob, is, uh, Bob is principal at uh, Then Design, at right? Yeah, at yeah. Then Design. And uh, he, he's, he's, you know, stepped back a little bit from TDA because of, you know, I know what our mayor does, and I know what I do um, as a councilman, I'm busier than I should be because the, the mayor, 
And this is and this is where we can be really valuable, folks. You build a credibility with the political leadership in your community, and they come to you and they ask you, can you go take this meeting for me? Because you understand what's going on here and you can bring it back and you could, you know, move it forward in the community. I have a meeting this afternoon with a, a developer where the mayor called me up and said, you need to be here with me on this. She doesn't call, she doesn't call the law director. She doesn't call the building commissioner. She calls the architect on the console to come and sit at her side and um, act as a sort of intermediary with the you know, design, um, as a design representative. We can be the star, which is the strategic trusted advisor resource. And we should be that for our clients and we can be that for our communities. Well, I think, I think that's just great advice. And I, I think uh, maybe you pulled in three or four politicians as part of your presentation today. So we'll see where this leads down the road, Judd. But we, we certainly appreciate your insight again on this. And uh, Thank you. it's very helpful. Let me play, Bruce. <laughs> like like getting your perspective as always Jed. so yeah. thank you and I, and I hope you'll hang on too as we uh move to uh, our fourth participant here and then we'll go into questions and answers on this so our, our fourth uh, guest is a member from of ai dayton and that's uh alex or alexandra uh bowler and alex uh, great to have you this afternoon thanks for having me Good. Good to see you. And um, we, we talked uh, last week a, a little bit about your path, and um, it's a little bit more twisting and winding than some of the ones that we, we, we heard here earlier. So you want to you tell us a little bit about your path to, that got you from where you were at to where you're kind of really now finding, you know, your, your really your niche, I would say? Sure. Um, okay, so... Starting way back, I grew up in the city of Dayton, which is where I now live in the same zip code. <laughs> um, and I went to Dayton Public Schools and it probably started as a teenager, just being more self-aware of community and different communities and being interested in mine. And I left for college and I found myself often talking about how great Dayton is and um, my friends would find that amusing. But um, so I left for about 10 years made my way back to Dayton. And so it was kind of just natural to become involved with the city as an adult. Um, the, so I, I, I guess I was involved. I got, I got asked to come to AIA Dayton as part of a board member. So I've been involved with that off and on since moving back, which I moved back in maybe 10 years ago. Um, and then I was on the City of Dayton Landmarks Commission. So they have very specific slots for architects and designers on their plan board, um, BZA and Landmarks Commission. So there aren't a lot of architects that live in the city of to fill the slots. Um, so I thought that'd be a fun thing to do. And I live in a historic neighborhood as well. So it seemed like a good fit. So I did I actually filled someone's term, finished their term, and then I did a three-year term. But then I had a couple kids, so the, the time commitment shifted a little. Um, but there was also an organization that formed while I was gone for the 10 years called Up Dayton, which um, was geared towards attracting and retaining young professionals to the Dayton region. And they have an annual like big summit that Basically, um, every, a large group of people met, they came up with all these ideas. It's kind of like a, an ideas charrette, but um, in a different context. And so I would go to those and then join the committee that was working on a particular project that I thought was fun. A lot of them were beautification projects. And then I eventually was on the board of Update In. So, so those were kind of my main three things, I guess, landmarks, Update In, and then AIA Date In. Um, but all of that's kind of circling back to what Bruce was alluding to. So during that, I was working at different firms around town and then um, I started my own firm, but most recently I've started a nonprofit with a couple people who are on this call mm -hmm. also are on the board. Um, so we are focused towards K-12 workshops, education geared towards um, architecture and design, very in line with what Judd was talking about. And um, so we have some programming scheduled this summer to um, go to some communities uh, like 
camps and programs that we're, we're going to do some architecture and design uh, workshops with K to 12 students. And we're hoping that at some point we can get back into schools and do some drop-in sessions in schools. Um, we're specifically focused on City of Dayton and Dayton Public Schools to try to get more kids interested at a younger age and to, in the profession and hopefully maybe diversify the profession a little. Um, and even if they don't go into architecture, maybe they are a client at some point in the future. And we think that is also important to have more inf informed clients. So that's kind of what we're, that's a short story of where I'm at now. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you, going back to the Landmarks Commission, I think when you were first trying to get involved publicly, you, you said you were really interested in the BZA, right? <laughs> I mean, realistic. Yeah. And it's like, well, but we need you here. So you kind of went with the flow and got there. Mm -hmm. But and eventually you did get to serve on the BZA, correct? After? Um, I did not do the BZA. Okay. I The reason the BZA was appealing was because my undergrad is actually urban planning. Planning, yes. And okay. so um, I have that connection too, which I think is driving a lot of my passion for community and community development, but in the architecture side. Okay. So, so yeah, but yeah, you're right. That's how I ended up on Landmarks. Okay, so so right now you're you're kind of in a transition period right now. You're you're just starting up your nonprofit and you're kind of closing down your architectural practice. Is that right? Is that right? I mean, the the firm was sort of a, in between the firm I was working at closed. I was pregnant with a second kid, and <laughs> it it just made the most sense for our family at the time. But I've also been teaching as an adjunct at Sinclair. Um, very closely with Charlie. So that's sort of been my part-time gig that's been going on while doing this nonprofit starting up. <laughs> okay. And, and and so what you're going through right now is trying to figure out not only putting a board together, that's what I understand, and mm -hmm. with some of the people who are actually on this call, but also trying to figure out the fundraising aspect and everything else of that. So, so unlike many of the other people who spoke before you, who kind of came into positions, you're kind of like creating your own, <laughs> your own <laughs> environment, right? <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Does that scare um, you a little yeah, bit? Yeah, <laughs> so we have, it's a little nerve wracking. Definitely the funding is the hardest part because ideally this will be at least a part-time job <laughs> um, and not just a volunteer job. But but yeah, we have four, four of us are architects that are on the board. And then we have three additional, no, two additional people that are sort of helping to get started. So we definitely have a strong architecture um, component. So, okay, so, so, you know, what are the challenges that you've had to overcome to get to this point, just to get where you're at now with the nonprofit? And what do you hope they'll accomplish in the next year? I guess those are the two biggies, right? When, they, when uh, you're trying to do something like this as a startup. Um, well, I'm definitely fortunate family-wise to be able to essentially not have a full-time job while while making this happen. So I conversations with my husband, we agree that we'll we'll give this a go and um, see how things work out. So the funding part, I'd say is definitely the hardest part and still working on that. I'm hoping in a year from now, we are we have um, a few weeks this summer. The summer is a little weird as we all know. Um, Dayton Public Schools goes till the end of June because of all of the different delays. So it's a very shortened summer for Dayton Public Schools students. Um, and, you know, everyone's sort of transitioning with different in-person and not. But we are excited to have some programming. So we're kind of thinking of this as our like pilot summer project. And then we'll see. I've actually am in talks with the community center for the fall doing like one session a week with after school programs. Um, and so, so yeah, we're, we're hoping we'll have some in school, like Dayton Public Schools workshops that could happen in this upcoming school year. But I don't think they yet know what's, what's going on yet for <laughs> their own side of things. So we're holding on that. <laughs> so what made you start the nonprofit? Is it something that you saw while you're teaching as an adjunct at Sinclair, or is it just your experiences within the community or a combination of both? Or <laughs> yeah, good question. So I guess growing up, I did not know any architects. Um, so it took me a while to reach the profession. I went to undergrad. I started undergrad having no idea what I was going to study, discovered urban planning, then I actually did Teach for America. So 
I've always had an interest in teaching and um, teaching math, but then I ended up going to architecture school. So I think it's my interests in teaching and architecture that have combined with the urban planning community involvement that have all led to this. Um, and being able to teach at Sinclair, I think reinforced the fact that I do indeed like teaching um, because seventh grade math was definitely not something I enjoyed <laughs> as, a, as a profession. So that was um, part of learning what you don't like is also very helpful on our career paths. <laughs> um, so, and just like, I mean, we've all seen the data of even, I mean, I'm sort of an example of a woman who's no longer in the traditional workforce in the architecture world, going more to the nonprofit sector. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing personally, but I would like to see more women in the field, like to see more people of color in the field. We've seen that data. Obviously I'm a white person from a middle, uh, like a fairly privileged background. Both of my parents are highly educated, but we, at, we grew up in the city and went to Delhi Public Schools, so I have a slightly different perspective. So I would like others to have the same opportunities I've had, and hopefully being positioned in this manner will, will help at least make people more aware of the profession and consider it as an option, which took me a while to come to. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely put all the pieces together. It was a long I think it was right. It was a, quite a process, but you, you've, you've melded them all together into this, and we really look forward to hearing, you know, how when you move forward, how this how this goes, and wish you luck. Um, Thanks. You're in you're in the early stages, but do you have any advice for somebody else listening today about, you know, some type a similar path they might like to take, or what? Um, I guess some of the. So having gone through starting a business and a nonprofit, it is significantly easier to start a business um, in terms of all of the bureaucracy, logistic things. So, um, but it's, but it's possible. The resources are there and like the actual making it happen and becoming a real thing on paper. Um, definitely reach out to people that, you know, ask questions and it, it can, that shouldn't be the barrier. Like that's achievable. Um, so I, but I'm fortunate that I have a variety of people I can reach out with that I've asked questions of to help make this happen. So definitely use your resources and networking through all these different things I've done over the years has been a huge help in getting to know the people and the people that I've recruited for the board um, <laughs> met along the way as well. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us today. I think that's probably new information and a new concept for a lot of a lot of people listening it's, it's pretty interesting for our profession I think um, as well so we're excited <laughs> <laughs> well uh, we we thank you for participating as part of this Alex uh, you know I, I know for, for for all the people we had on the call today um, uh, over the past week or so we we've been having much longer phone calls with everyone learning everything we get we need to know about their lives <laughs> and so uh, that was very informative and, and great uh, opportunities for us to get to, to know everyone who participated today and uh, we're, we're, we're thankful that you were able to take the time Alex to, to be part of this um, and uh, we, you know I, I, I think there's a lot of exciting things in, in front of you with with this this new nonprofit be and and you know when we looked at this originally um i think we looked at everyone who had interesting paths in terms of what they were doing and and how they were engaged and and really it also came across as everyone's doing something different from the political arena to the to the schools and education to the community it's all about different things and it's hands-on and board work and and everything else so there's so many ways that we as architects, as individuals, can get involved within our communities, and I think that's uh, that's that that really through your stories, I, I think was uh, something that I think think became very apparent to to those listening today. So, um, Karen, unless you have anything else, I think maybe we can kind of push this over to Matt and see if uh, if there are questions that uh, we want yeah, to pose yeah. to. Sure, just one quick comment. Um, yeah. Before we start the Q&A, there is a the link has been posted for um, in the chat and any questions that you might have of all four will get started. But um, please, you know, raise your hand or let us know if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists today. So over to you, Matt. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks Aaron. I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat here. So feel free to, you know, type, type your question in there. Um, while we get started here, I, I guess I have a question for, for the group. Um, <clears throat> I, I kind of heard a, a little bit of a tone or a, 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 a theme of, you know, once you say yes, it kind of opens the door to uh, repeated, um, you know, questions and, and more involvement and um, more opportunities. So I guess the question is, you know, after, after your, that first exposure to community involvement uh, or, or volunteer service or um, advocacy, what made it easier the time when, by the time the next ask came around? Like, is there a certain level of comfort that comes with the, the first experience that makes the, the second one that much easier to step into? I'd be curious for, uh, for your thoughts on that. I'll go. It's Aaron. Um, yeah, Matt, you know, for like, for me, the first experience, yes, I think there is a comfort level to it, but I, for me, I'm kind of different. I'm single. I don't have a family. So it was also kind of being a part of a group again. Um, so that, that's something that I was looking for too, you know, in high school, you're part of sports or whatever, and you kind of miss out on that. But I definitely think there's, there's a comfort level that once you start participating, you can, um, it's that much easier to, and, and then kind of, as I said earlier, it's, it's the satisfaction of seeing what that, what you were involved in does for the community. So knowing that you were a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Um, and it just makes that next thing easier, knowing that you could be the person to change continue to, to make the world better. You know, I think that most of us who are probably involved in this stuff have a, a genetic defect. It's a gene that won't let you say no. And somebody comes to you and suggests something and you're the next thing you know, you're doing it. And then the next thing comes and you're doing that too. And the next thing comes and you're doing that too. Uh, and it, it kind of piles on. Uh, there is a great satisfaction in the, as Aaron just alluded to in uh, the contribution that you make to the community and seeing something happen uh, that, you know, I know that we all would design a building and one of the greatest satisfactions of, for an architect is when you see your idea come to life, when you see the building start to take form and the project look like what it was intended to be and it gets used by the client in the way that they had it hoped to use it. The same thing tr is true for community advocacy. When you see something come together and people gaining some benefit from it, there is nothing more satisfying. And that becomes the, if you will, the generator. And it drives you to continue to do more. But in answer to Dave, Dave uh, Robar's comment in the chat, um, <laughs> which is, if is your yes doesn't mean as much if you don't know how to say no. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it depends on what you bring to the table. You know, there's a brilliant statement: um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, and we have to we have to spend time demonstrating our caring uh, in, in the community, in our work, uh, bringing our own personal passions to it, and those get observed. That's great. Appreciate the uh, feedback there. That, I think that's uh, it's really good for um, even me to hear. So appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, we did... We did get a question in the chat also, um, you know, can we, can we hear a little bit more about advocacy involvement and how, what that looks like in shaping policies or guidelines, uh, recommendations, um, in whatever, I, I guess, whatever um, arena, you know, all, I think all four of you kind of have a little bit different um, experience in, in different areas. So I think, I think that'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about what that looks like for you specifically. 
I have a very tiny example from when I was on Landmarks Commission. Um, the issue of solar panels came up that hadn't really been addressed before, but solar panels in historic neighborhoods can be a little controversial. And so we had a rather large debate over multiple meetings um, as multiple groups were trying to put solar panels. And so we, we ended up sort of redrawing, rewriting, I guess, the policy of what previously was allowed as solar panels in historic neighborhoods to a new one that sort of fit more 20, whatever year that was, 2018 or whatever. Um, but it, it took some convincing of, and, and we, we allowed more solar panels than originally were, but, but it also became more clear, so there would be less up in the air. Uh. In, the, in this last year of the pandemic going on, one of the things that I was, have been involved with is um, in Northeast Ohio has a group that is the uh, <clears throat> Northeast Ohio Arts and Culture Caucus. And they have two subcommittees, placemaking and public policy. And I became the chair of the public policy subcommittee and was involved in uh, promoting the legislation that has led to the Save Our Stages Act in Congress and wrote letters to our um, senators and as a campaign representing um, communities of Northeast Ohio to uh, get funding for those uh, venues that were going dark because of the pandemic and how do we support them. And, and that has, you know, has been great to see that happen, to actually see that funding come about as a result of that effort. Um, to Alexandra's point, um, I wrote legislation in our own community because we felt everything that is not in the zoning code, you can't do. If it's not there, you can't do it. And so I felt that the opportunity to install photovoltaic systems in homes was pretty valuable today and going forward. And so myself and uh, took on the, the task of reaching out and getting support from outside resources to help me write the legislation that we now have in place in our community to encourage and promote the installation of photovoltaic systems in the community, including how they deal with you know some of the other some of the architectural issues that I'm sure that Alexander dealt with. Kind of on the same. Do that on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Um, along the same lines, Main Street Wadsworth um, has had a, a pretty close, we're very lucky to have a close relationship with the city of Wadsworth. Um, and so they always consult with us, um, our design committee, before um, making any big changes. So Main Street Wadsworth helped the city create our design guidelines, which was a number of years ago before my time. But since we have made some revisions to those design guidelines. Um, and so it's been nice to have a seat at the table while we're doing that so that we can really kind of hone in on some of those issues that we might have within the community. A lot of great answers. Um, again, it, it varies according to your experiences and what part of, of the world you've been living in as far as, uh, you know, whether it's practice or education or, or, or within uh, public, uh, public services through government service. So, um, I'm, Matt, there, there is another one up there from Alex. From your, yeah. Your, yeah, so. yeah, great. It's a great question from Alex. Right. Um, you know, talking about that line or, or where is the line between, you know, involvement and advocacy as a, from an individual standpoint or uh, versus, you know, as a, as a firm, um, even AIA involvement. So I'm curious, you know, again, we have probably a breadth of experience here, but I'd be curious to, to hear, you know, a little bit more along these lines, uh, that sort of individual versus corporate advocacy uh, experience. So I'll start again. And um, <clears throat> so for me personally, I've always had a, a very hard time disconnecting who I am as an architect <clears throat> or a architecture designer before I was licensed from my personal life. 
So I've always been an architect first. Um, sorry, I got a tickle in my throat. <laughs> and uh, it's, so I guess anything that I've ever gotten involved in, it's always been like, I'm bringing this with me, even if it's as simple as mentorship. So I think that's the only, on the personal side, that's the only thing that I could kind of maybe disconnect a little bit. And that would be just mentorship and helping to grow the next generation. Um, being involved with Bowling Green State University and, and sitting in on their juries and the student work, um, that's always kind of been, I guess, more of the personal fulfillment, knowing that I'm making it better for the next generation so that they can continue to build. Everything else for me has been um, usually somehow connected to my expertise as an architect. Um, but, you know, I, oftentimes people may get involved in their church or, or other activities that I would say is probably more personal. Are there thoughts, Judd, Emily? Uh, no? the, first, the first thing you have to do is decide what you're passionate about. Where, where, are your, where do your interests lie? Um, whether you're doing it as a firm, uh, you know, back in the day, we had a community uh, service committee at Hirschman Architects that several of us sat on and we decided what were the things that we wanted to do that we felt were valuable to the, to the firm and to the community. And then, you know, what are you personally interested in? And that, you know, gives you the impetus to start to think, you know, you go back to that pro -eminate concept that I brought up before. And it works both at the firm level and at the individual level. So decide what you want to, what, what is me, will provide meaning to your life and to the activities in the firm and just do it, use the switch. <laughs> I would say for me, it was completely individual. Sometimes, uh, against what the firm may have desired. If, so it was not necessarily promoted by the firm. Um, usually AIA involvement was acceptable, but beyond that, it was all individual. And I didn't work at any firms that did any, any pro bono work or, or any sort of specific community besides being on some boards, but I felt like it was primarily for potential work. <laughs> Emily, any your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just going to say my experience was sort of unique coming in as an individual, um, but carrying the experience of the firm behind me. So in my dealings with uh, the city and Main Street Wadsworth, I, I tended to direct work <laughs> um, away from me um, and to people who could um, handle things like that, um, that maybe was a little out of my comfort zone. One of the things I have in my notes is that um, the community involvement, um, kind of like Aaron said, it's it's hard to disconnect for me, and I have a hard time with boundaries in general. So it's like there's this very fine line between educating um, people in the community and also uh, sort of giving away services. So I that was a hard line for me to balance, um, especially because I was coming in as an individual and um, that situation was sort of unique, so. There, there are two ways that you get involved in things. There are two paths, if you will. There's the volunteer path and there's the ask path. And the ask path is where most people wanna be, where you're invited to be there because you bring to the table something that is of value and significance to that group or organization. But you don't get there until you've been on the volunteer path and people see what you can do and how you do it, how you conduct yourself and the level of commitment that you have to those things you're passionate about. And when you do that suffi sufficiently enough time, you start to begin to develop relationships with really great people. And those people want to work with you. They want to work with you as an architect for their business. Imagine what you would do if you're, you're making money at this. And they want to work with you in the organization because you have great ideas and, you, and you're willing to contribute your efforts in 
advancing that organization's objective. So think about volunteering and then see how that leads you to uh, being engaged. Yeah, and Judd, I just want to piggyback real quick since you brought up volunteering. One, this is just one of the things that have kind of rubbed me wrong of late is, you know, volunteering is giving of yourself, not because you're your firm is paying you to volunteer, that it, it doesn't necessarily progress, it doesn't radiate the same passion. If you're being paid to do something, even though it may seem fun, you're not truly giving of yourself. So you're, it's kind of like I was saying earlier, it doesn't radiate out and create that positivity. So to truly volunteer is to do it of your own free will with no incentives or, or anything coming back other than personal. Oh. Some of those end up being voluntold. <laughs> right, exactly. You're going to do this. You're on this committee. You're going to be part of this. I'm sure a lot of things in life works, right? <laughs> I'm sure no one on this call has any experience with any of that, Judd. I'm, I'm curious. We're, we're getting close to the end of, the, of our time together. So I, I have one more question for the group. And, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to know just what, what's the most gratifying or rewarding uh, experience that you've had? Uh, with with what you talked about today, you know, um, be curious to know what what's what's the what's the thing that you kind of take away is like yeah that 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 was all worth it because of, because of that. It's it's the expression on people's faces, you know, when they see it. So as I was I talked a little bit earlier, we had registration day for Miracle League just this past Sunday and. A lot of these kids haven't even seen the building, but just seeing their faces as we talked about the building, knowing that the building is built for them, you know, and when they see it at the first game on May 2nd, just watching their face and them knowing that this whole thing was done for them, that's that's what's important. Knowing that you, you've impacted, it doesn't matter how many hours you've spent or the headaches to, to fundraise the money to get it built, it's seeing their faces, the users, how they use it, and and that makes it all worth it. God? Um, there are a few, um, it, and, and many of them have to do with uh, some of the, and, and Aaron alluded to it, the outcome uh, of those people who utilize whatever it is that you get involved with. Um, I guess, one of the most exciting ones for me was when Pinecrest opened up uh, a couple of years ago now, and this this whole I, this whole project that had you know come from a lot of hard work and a lot of effort and a lot of um, gnashing of teeth to make it happen. Um, when the ribbon cutting ceremony took place and they had all the fireworks that went with it, like this was this was really great. Um, but on the other hand, it's when people experience something. Uh, as I mentioned, we recently created this committee on racial equity and diversity and inclusion. And that the meeting that came together there and the expression from being able to facilitate the expressions of people who are concerned about what the community is going to be like and how we deal with some of the issues and policies that we face have to face down these days, that was a wonderful experience for me that we were actually able to convene that and make it happen. Now we're working on it. Now we have the, we have the hard work to do, but that first meeting, was the, those first meetings were really great. Good. Alex or Emily? Um, so I guess I, I, when I worked with AmeriCorps, I did sort of a sample workshop like this and we, um, designed and build and built something in an affordable housing community with the kids who lived there and so they designed seating next to their playground and so the most exciting part well obviously watching them be so proud of what they've just accomplished but then you know seeing in a, in a couple hours we turn around and there's some other kids that are sitting there using it doing their homework was just really fun to see that it's actually being used. Great example. Emily, anything to add? There you go. 
I just love having friends and family come to town and we go downtown and we experience downtown and it's it's really like out of a Hallmark movie or something like Wadsworth is just so cute <laughs> and I I love having friends there everyone tells me how great it is Matt I know you can say something to this too it's just fantastic and it it brings me so much community pride knowing that I have some part in it as little as it may seem some days. I, I want to add. Me proud of you. I, I wanted to add one more uh, anecdote in that regard. Um, one of the programs that I've done with John Hay over the years, every year I do an extended school year program called the Urban Design Lab, and you know, the kids work on a local project in their community and understand planning and development, uh, and they have to identify a, a project and then come up with a. a solution to it. And at the end of the project, they do a presentation before a reactor panel. And on the reactor panel, I've had the director of planning for the city of Cleveland, actually the four past directors of planning for the city of Cleveland. Um, and the, one of the kids said something without any provocation, without any scripting, that was the greatest thing that I could hear. The young African-American kid probably, is, I think he was in 10th grade, and he said, I never realized that I could have an impact on my community and make a contribution to the ideas that would change it. And I, Holy, <laughs> we're here to do, and you got it. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I ran up and I gave him a big hug. And I said, you're, you're the man. This is the, this is the poster child. And I think that is an absolutely fantastic way to end, Judd. So I, I think just to, to close a little bit on this, um, you know, whether it's through committees or through the AIA or individually or, you know, w however you approach things, I, I think there's, there's, there's something out there for you. And I think that's what we're really um, trying to just just make sure that everyone uh, sees and, and hears as part of today's program. So I'm, uh, I am I thank everyone for really hanging in with us for the last hour and a half. This has been fantastic. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, to Karen uh, to to close out today's program. Karen, maybe <laughs> unmute myself. Thank you, Judd, for that inspiring ending. It's almost felt like it was scripted in there, but, but not. Um, so thank you to all our presenters um, for your inspiring stories today and, and your service and leadership in your communities. Um, it's really been inspiring for me, I know. Um, if, I'll just mention, if you haven't already, <laughs> I'm on, on this truck, donate to the AI Ohio PAC. <laughs> Stay tuned for AI, you know, stay tuned for the movement on our um, SB 49, the PAL legislation, and plan on joining us on May 19th. That's for our fourth session of the advocacy series, which is going to be entitled Advocacy in You. Um, and one last big thank you to uh, Bruce Sikanik, Matt Toddy, and, and uh, Kate Brunswick for all the hard work bringing today's program uh, to reality. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy your day. We'll see you next month for advocacy again. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Yep. Thanks, everyone, <laughs> for attending. Thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs>